for joining and it's um, okay Let's see if I can make this work okay so hopefully you can see my screen oh I'm right at the end aren't I but it's a bit okay so uh, let's just quickly skip back you're going to a high speed preview of what's to come okay Right, that was me checking. Thanks, out. that was a great talk. Yeah, <laughs> yes, it's finished. Right, so um, I'm going to talk about um, the drivers of global and local sea level change. And um, so there's a, quite an author list here. This is work um, that was done um, as part of a set of climate projections for, for um, UK government. Um, and then really it kind of summarises, what I'm going to do is summarise some of the, the work of that project and um, and I, I guess the other main thing I've been involved in recently is the AR6, the sixth assessment report of Working Group One, where I was a lead author on Chapter Seven on climate sensitivity, and also contributing author on the on the um, on Chapter Nine on sea level. And so I'll explain some of the linkages of this work to AR6. Um, recently, I took up a, a part-time position at the University of Bristol, so just acknowledging them there as well. Okay, um, so the talk outline looks like this. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you an overview of the UK CP18 project. There may be for, uh, folks who are interested in that in particular, because it generated quite a lot of data products, which are publicly and um, freely available. Um, I'm gonna talk about the global mean sea level projections that we developed. And, and, and in particular, one of the innovations we made was to develop projections out to 2300. And then there's a, there are some methodological linkages to AR6 and some things that we achieved in AR6, which I think are, are very useful. Um, once I've spoken a bit about global mean sea level, I'm gonna talk about how we convert that to local sea level projection um, and what the methods are for doing that. And then, um, uh, right, at, so then what we'll do is we'll get into um, looking at the different drivers of future sea level change and there are different ways that you can think about you know what what um, drives future sea level change and in particular what drives the uncertainty in projections which is considerable a lot of what i'm going to present today is based on this paper that was published in in earth's future in in um, 2020 so that's the key the key reference for the talk but I, i'll touch upon other publications as we go along Okay, so UK CP18 was a national set of climate projections that was um, that was launched, or the main launch happened in late in uh, 2018. It updates the the um, previous set of UK climate projections that was released in 2009. So that's UK CP09. Um, there were various different aspects to that. Um, I was in charge of delivering the marine projections, but there were also uh, probabilistic projections over the land surface. There were some um, global projections using a quarter degree ocean model and a 60 kilometer kind of atmospheric model. And um, then there were some regional downscaling projections and various other and some consideration observations and what we call derived um, projections. Um, so there's four reports um, and numerous fact sheets. So this was partly, um, you know, this was for UK government to, to inform the, um, UK climate change risk assessments, which happen every five years or so. Um, and, and the sea level methods, is, there's quite a detailed report, which I'm presenting a link to um, here. But, you know, if, if you Google uh, UK CP18 mar um, marine report, then, 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 then it should come up uh, fa fairly easily. Um, so obviously the kind of headline things that we provided were things like mean sea level change for the UK capital cities, which are illustrated here. Um, and this is for a high, a high emission scenario in red and a lower, a lower greenhouse gas emission scenario in blue. So those are RCP 2.6 for the low emissions, RCP 8.5 for the high emissions. Um, but we also uh, published some papers kind of subsequently or um, in the development of this work. And, and, and these are two of the key papers. So one of, so the first one, which I'll talk about a bit more in the subsequent slides, really took a view on what were the contributions of 21st century projections of extreme sea level change that was led by my uh, uh, colleague, Tom Howard, who works at the Met Office. 
And then um, a key methodological advance was this uh, paper um, about um, extending semen five projections of global mean temperature change and, and, and sea level rise geothermal expansion using a physically based um, um, emulator. And again, I will talk a bit more about that in the subsequent slides. So um, some of you will be probably familiar with this kind of, uh, kind of idea, but re really what I'm trying to present here is, is, is a, a kind of a conceptual picture of how I see the different drivers of sea level fitting together, and I, I affectionately call this the jigsaw puzzle. Um, but starting on the left-hand side, we have global scales. And as we move to the right, we get to increasingly local scales. But as I'm sure many of you are aware, there are drivers of uh, global mean sea level rise, essentially the, you know, the, the uh, thermal expansion from heat um, um, uptake by the ocean, and then we have uh, the mass addition from glaciers and ice sheets, and, and in the projections, we, we split the ice sheet contribution into a component from surface mass balance and one from ice dynamic processes. Then there's also the potential for changes in land water storage, of course, which can have a, have a measurable effect on sea level and an impact in the projections, and then combine all these and we get a total sea level change. As we move to regional scales, then we have to consider processes such as ocean circulation and density changes. Um, changes in land, ice and water storage have an effect on Earth's gravity field and also Earth's rotation and solid Earth um, deformation. And so these need to be accounted for as we start to move to regional scales. Another important driver of uh, regional and local scales as well as glacialized static adjustment, sometimes referred to as post-glacial rebound. So this is essentially the response or the slow response of Earth's mantle and the solid Earth to the last deglaciation. And then we get to local scales, then we can start thinking about some other um, phenomena such as tide surges and waves. And there's some interesting potential for um, kind of interactions between the mean sea level and some of these phenomena. And I'll touch on some of that as well. And of course, there are non-climatic processes that uh, can be important, uh, highlighted in this uh, kind of grey box. Uh, this is not something that we explicitly um, kind of account for within the projections that I'm going to talk about today. But if, it, you know, these can be very kind of important processes to bear in mind for local adaptation planning or kind of understanding, you know, the local signals that we're seeing in the observations. Okay, so I'm going to talk you through what might at first look like a fairly complex slide, but this is uh, this was that Howard et al. paper, which really trying to summarise what the drivers of changes of, of sea level extremes around the UK are. So on this left-hand panel, you can see a bunch of numbered uh, boxes, and these correspond to Class A tide gauge sites around the UK coastline. So they go up um, in ascending order in a clockwise direction around the UK. And you can see the corresponding num numbers on these on the right hand panels. So each of these panels looks at changes in a surge, uh, sorry, um, storm surges for the top panel, uh, significant wave height for the middle panel, and the potential for changes in uh, tidal amplitude um, in the bottom panel. And on every single panel, we can see this kind of green kind of shaded region, which is telling us what, uh, what the mean sea level projection is. Um, and, as, and as you can see, we have higher levels of mean sea level rise projected for the south of the UK than we do for the north of, of uh, the UK. So that gives us this characteristic um, decrease as, um, as we progress clockwise around the UK. Uh, and then it starts to increase again as we start coming down the east coast of of the UK, um, but yeah, essentially, so, so, sorry, man. Um, we've, we've got a question in the chat. Do you mind if? Oh yeah, like sure. You interrupted or? Yeah, that's fine. Um, um, so, so we've got a question from Vivian. Yeah, sure. So the answer to that is that yes, those will be. Um, they will be accounted for, um, and I'll kind of talk a bit more detail about that when we get to the to the to the section on. Um, on methods 
So this is really just a synthesis of the UK CP18 results really to make it clear that it's really the mean sea level, which is the dominant driver of changes in extreme uh, in a coastal, um, yeah, for the UK coastline, um, yeah. So Gavin's put a question in the chat as well. BLM for UK is not in not insignificant, though. Uh, yeah, I think I think that's yeah. So I'll talk more about processes of vertical land motion. Um, it, this talk won't cover things that are not related to GIA. Um, I'm, I'm not going to get into differential GPS measurements or anything like that, um, but those are indeed valuable measurements and important considerations um, for site specific kind of decision making. Okay, so um, without going into too much of the details, the main point to take away is that the mean sea level is the dominant change that we're likely to see over the 21st century. Um, and then you, you can read more of the details, of course, in this paper and in the UK CP18 report, if you want a bit more detail, but I thought it useful to, to give you the kind of the broad picture and some of the synthesis of that work as a whole. And then from here on in, we'll focus a bit more on the mean sea level part. Okay, so just to say, you know, why do we get this, um, why do we get this characteristic pattern of sea level change in the UK? So a large uh, part of it is to do, do with the response of sea level to glacial ice static adjustment, which is shown in this left hand panel. And then um, on the right hand side, so I've picked out a couple of tide gauge locations, which are near the kind of maxima, I guess, and minima of this, I guess, or maximum positive, maximum negative, uh, at least on the UK coastline. And we can see that this is really coming predominantly from the GIA contribution. Um, although um, when we think about the projections, there can be uh, some difference in the Greenland um, kind of expression um, with negative values from Greenland um, kind of applying to the northern parts of the UK and almost zero contribution for more southerly parts of the UK to do with the GRD fingerprint. And we'll talk more about that as well, actually, in future slides. Okay, so this is if if you are interested in finding out more about the data sets, um, I, I guess particularly the global projections might be of interest to people, but um, there's a bit of information on, on this slide. Um, so they're all available through the CEDA data catalog and um, and also there's a user interface if you prefer something, but it's mainly just to know that those uh, simulations and all all of the sea level projections are available for the entire coastline of the UK, um, both for the 21st century, but also out to 2300. Okay, so let's get on to the projections of global mean sea level change. So essentially, what we did for UK CP18 was still based on the CMIP5 models and the methods presented in um, um, IPCC AR5. Um, the treatment of the contribution from Antarctic ice dynamics was updated following Leverman et al. 2014. And for this talk, all the projections are presented uh, relative to 1986-2005 baseline, the same as was used by AR5 and SROC. I think the last thing to say is that um, these projections are very similar to those that were published in um, um, SROC, where they also um, had an updated treatment of the Antarctic ice dynamics, although they used a slightly different a slightly different approach for doing that. You can see that for the lower kind of emission scenario, so this is the total in the solid black and the grey shading areas, and then I've got the, the AR5 projections in kind of dashed and dotted lines. You can see it doesn't make a great deal of difference for, for the lower scenarios, but it starts to make a bit more of a difference for the high for the higher emission scenarios. Um, an, important, uh, an important development that wasn't there for AR5 or indeed SROC was that the Monte Carlo framework that's used to develop the global mean sea level projections is carried through to the regional and local projections of sea level. And that's quite important for making sure that we're representing the uncertainties correctly. And I will talk a bit more about why that is important. Um, there were some statistics statistical approximations made for AR5, which are reasonable, um, but uh, suboptimal, I would say. 
Okay, so thinking about the extended 2300 uh, kind of global projections. So those were projections I just showed you out to 2100. So how might we go about making projections out to 2300? Um, so we may make use of this two layer model um, energy balance kind of model, which has a two layer ocean with a, with a temperature anomaly and a heat capacity. Um, it needs a, a radiative forcing, an effective radiative forcing as an input, and it has a value of, of um, alpha to, and, uh, which uh, represents Earth's radiative response. Then there's an exchange coefficient between the two ocean layers. So this is a well, well used and you know, uh, um, tool within climate science to represent you know, some global aspects of the climate system response. And um, essentially what we did is we applied uh, some, um, some tunings of that model uh, to specific CMIP5 models in order to extend them. And what I'm showing you here is the trying to capture the performance of um, that simple climate model um, uh, um, emulator, which is tends to be how we, we refer to this certainly in um, AR6, that's a, a, a common word that's used um, for this kind of simpler modeling approaches. Essentially what we have is the AR5 um, uh, CMIP5 ensemble in red, then, then the two layer model uh, in green with a solid line in shaded regions. And then over plotted in gray are the individual CMIP models where we have them for those that did run to 2300. So you can see that um, this model seems to do a reasonable job of uh, of emulating the response of specific um, CMIP5 models and we're able to build an ensemble. And I guess some of the nice characteristics is it looks pretty consistent with the, with the available models to 2300. And um, it seems to behave uh, pretty reasonably in terms of the models that do have those kind of extended simulations available. There's more, there's a bit more detail in, in this reference. Um, it was published in environmental research letters. Um, so this is for surface temperature um, I'm showing you here. So this is the temperature change as a function of the three emission scenarios, 2.6, 4.5 and 8.5. And then um, we can do a similar thing with global thermal expansion. So the difference here is that we, um, oh yeah, so here we are, we also need some knowledge of the, of the, um, of the relationship between global ocean heat content change and global uh, thermosteric sea level within within the CMIP five models, but that's uh, just a um, a single number coefficient that we that we take there to do that conversion. Um, so again, you can see that there there's quite nice consistency between the twenty one hundred and twenty three hundred projections, um, and uh, it seems like a reasonable basis for doing this extension. And the nice thing here, of course, is that these are really traceable to the CMIP models. Um, so there are other approaches that have been taken, uh, but it's not as clear how, how, how you uh, achieve traceability to the underlying model set. Okay, so then you have to do a bit more work to convert that into um, sea level projections. Um, so we make some simple assumptions. Uh, the, the raw kind of ingredients, um, if you like, a global surface temperature projections and global thermal expansion. And actually most of the ice sheet stuff that gets, um, so the surface mass balance terms uh, and the glaciers are related um, back to global surface temperature. Um, the um, glacier ice mass is capped at a realistic value that reflects the total glacier mass worldwide. So you can see that under RCP 8.5, that the glacier mass does, does indeed top out there and you, you, know, you don't get any further contribution from that. And then I'm showing the other, the other um, contributions in the individual lines. And uh, for the purposes of clarity of presentation, it's only the total thermal expansion that have these um, uncertainty bars. But you can see we're getting some pretty large uncertainties by 2300. So these have got lower scientific confidence than the 20, 100 projections. So this is something that was obviously picked up in AR6 as well, that it's very hard to have the same level of scientific confidence on these longer time horizons. So I'd say that they illustrate that they illustrate commitment 
and they give an approximate set of values for which we can start to look at what the implications of those levels of sea level rise are. But I think it's important to explicitly represent this long term commitment. And it's kind of problematic to finish our plots at um, 2100, in my view, uh, when kind of communicating uh, to stakeholders about the, on, on this topic. OK, so this is kind of details um, the individual components. I think it's fair to say that in most instances, essentially what happens for the 2300 projections is we are holding the 2100 rates constant between 2100 and 2300. Um, and the surface mass balance uses the same relationships which were used um, under AR5 for Antarctica um, and the glaciers. So the land water storage, again, we, um, we have this, you know, th these are all very simple approaches, um, but we kind of deemed them reasonable um, as a first, a first go at coming up with some projections on these time horizons. Okay, so before I go any further, I just wanted to give you a quick snapshot of how these, how the methods I've described stack up against AR6. Um, so I've chosen the two, the two kind of, uh, you know, the lowest emission scenario on the left, RCP 2.6, and the higher emission scenario, and highest emission scenario on the right, RCP 8.5. Um, so I've got the UK CP 18 methods, and, and those are the ones I'll focus on for the rest of the talk. So they're the black line and the gray shaded, and then I've got the AR6 in the dotted and dashed line. So you can see there's actually remarkable agreement out to 2150, which is where they kind of drew the line for the AR6 projections. And then what they did is rather than give continuous projections out to 2300, what they did is give an assessment of the uh, projected range at 2300. But all I'm trying to illustrate here is these are highly consistent out to 2150. And then beyond that, of course, there is some additional um, uh, kind of uncertainty. Um, the other thing, of course, to bear in mind is that um, AR6 uh, had this additional um, statement, which is that uh, based on low confidence processes, so those associated with uh, the instability processes of the Antarctic ice sheet, West Antarctica in particular, we cannot rule out under a high emission scenario sea level at 2300 in excess of 15 meters. Of course, that's, that, that, that is quite a big statement to come out of AR6, and I'm sure it will have a lot of implications for adaptation planning and decision making and the, and the whole dialogue around future emissions. OK, um, so there's some interesting things about um, CMIP 5 and CMIP 6, 6 models in terms of their climate sensitivity. So this is one of the facts that was in Chapter 7 of, of, of AR6. And really, um, the thing to take away from this is that although um, CMIP 6 models have a systematically higher um, uh, climate sensitivity value than CMIP 5 and a, and a broader range, when you look at the assessed best, best kind of estimate of um, AR6 and the associated ranges, they, they are kind of more similar, I guess, to the CMIP 5 model ensemble in some ways. And we don't, you know, um, and that's quite important when it comes to the projections, I guess. Um, so AR6 had this approach where we, um, where we used the same two layer model system to constrain future projections based on this equally, um, equilibrium climate um, sensitivity. And I guess what I'm saying here is one of the reasons that, um, one of the reasons I think we see such a good agreement here is related to that constraining based on the assessed um, ECS. And indeed, if we take, so this is quite a busy slide, uh, it's a, a study that's definitely worth a look at by Tim Hermans et al, in, uh, published in GRL. Essentially what uh, Tim did was take uh, the CMIP5 or, or the CMIP6 model ensemble and use the AR5, AR5 methods to try and understand how different sea level rise projections would look like just for the change of CMIP6 models and um, under the SSP scenarios. And so the shaded regions with the horizontal bars are showing you the CMIP6 result for three different scenarios with the individual components uh, along, the, along the X axis. And then the kind of uh, dashed lines 
in black are showing you what the CMIP5 result would be. So you can see, you can see that despite the higher climate sensitivity within CMIP6, the, at least for the 21st century projections, the uh, the um, differences between these uh, blocks are, are and and the projections as a whole are relatively modest. The last column um, is um, a, a global mean sea level rate, uh, which is showing that there's certainly potential with a higher climate sensitivity, of course, to have high levels of sea level rise, but maybe those wouldn't be realized until the centuries that follow. The other interesting thing from my perspective about this is, is if you take a high um, ECS model or a low kind of ECS model and base and, and kind of use the same methods as in AR5, then you can see that it's possible to get projected sea level that's well outside the ranges of, of, um, of the ensemble approach. Um, and that's interesting when thinking about um, low likelihood, but high impact outcomes of future climate change. So that's something that we'll probably look to exploit um, in future. Okay, so one, one thing, I mean, it may, I mean, I'm, I apologize, this is such a busy plot, there's a lot of information here to take in, but I think one of the key things to me is understanding how these different uncertainties which are associated with the, the width of these bars, how do they relate to the total uncertainty here, and um, it's not as straightforward as you might think because of the correlation structure different across the different terms, so this is thermal expansion, um, the ice dynamics for Antarctica, surface mass balance for, for Antarctica, and so on for Greenland, the glacier and the land water contribution. But you can see that there's a correlation structure as we might expect. So thermal expansion um, is positively correlated with Greenland um, surface mass balance um, because Greenland, uh, you know, the surface mass balance tends to be more negative in a, in a warming world and obviously the same with Greenland. There's an anti-correlation with the surface mass balance in Antarctica because a warmer atmosphere tends to promote more snowfall. And so you have to kind of account for this correlation structure when you're determining the overall uncertainty. And so that's why it's important that the same Monte Carlo framework is used all the way through to the local projections. Um, and that's a key part of the analysis that I'll show you later, the fact that we preserve this correlation structure. Okay, so moving on to um, local sea level change. This is really just how do we go about doing that? So one of the things we have to do is establish the regression of local stereodynamic sea level change against global thermal expansion. Um, so this is an approach that's been taken by previous studies. It's essentially the same as a pattern scaling approach, but what we can see is that um, generally speaking, for a given location, there's a pretty linear relationship between local sea level as it's expressed within the climate model, which just covers the stereodynamic part um, and the global thermal expansion within that model. And it's pretty linear and it's pretty independent of scenario, at least to first order. However, it's worth being aware if you're not already about the work by Yuan and Kopp 2021, where they have a slightly more sophisticated approach to this, which does an even better job of kind of capturing some of some of the um, some of the non-linear shapes to this curve. Um, so essentially, um, for a given location, a different CMIP5 model will give us a different slope of, of um, the relationship between this line, and we can factor that uh, kind of into our um, kind of into our uncertainties. I, I mentioned these GRD patterns before, so many of you may be um, familiar with this. I think it's probably most instructive to just think about the top row of these. So the bottom row is telling us something about the uncertainty. Um, but essentially, um, these are the uh, these are the combined effects of gravity, rotation, and solid earth uh, deformation associated with uh, surface mass balance and ice dynamics for Antarctica. But they're characterized by a, a near field sea level fall and a far field rise, and somewhere kind of in between, we have um, you know we have a zero crossing where the dotted line is, and then we have the one to one line which is the solid gray. Um, and, you know, these, these, um, these patterns are strongly dependent on the mass distribution around the world. And so you can get some quite kind of interesting structure for glaciers um, and obviously differences in, 
in Antarctica, kind of reflecting where the centers of mass are around surface mass bands and, and the ice dynamics, which tends to be concentrated more on, you know, particularly in West Antarctica. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so these express the local sea level change per unit rise of global sea level from each of these uh, kind of contributions. And, and then this is just a zoom in, I guess, to show you maybe a bit more clearly if the last ones were, were not as clear on your on your screen. Um, there is one for land water as well, uh, which needs to be taken into account. Um, so one thing this, um, this study doesn't do is really look at the uncertainty in the mass distributions themselves. Um, I think for the ice sheets, it's fairly well constrained, but one could imagine, depending exactly what the pattern of glacier changes, it, might, it could affect um, you know the time evolution of these of these patterns over time, and I um, and for land water, I guess um, it depends on how reliable those assumptions are um, moving forward into the future. Okay, another important process is glacial ice static adjustment. So we take the approach of actually using models uh, to try and constrain this, and um, you know, so there we use the ice five G and ice six G models as well as a Lambeck solution um, uh, to try and understand something about what what the um, about what the uncertainty is in in this term um, and you can see that that the uncertainties tend to uh, correspond to places which have been glaciated in 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 the past um, this is also factored into our approach um, so essentially what we have are these different global time series, uh, thermal expansion glaciers, Greenland, Antarctica, and land water. And um, it's a Monte Carlo approach. And um, we essentially, uh, so for thermal expansion, we combine that with a, a random draw of a regression coefficient uh, to get the local uh, um, stereodynamic sea level change. And we also randomly draw a set of GRD patterns, although as it turns out, the uncertainty associated with the three different um, kind of estimates, so I keep, I keep accidentally clicking. Um, the uncertainty is so, like essentially there's very little uncertainty associated with the GRD patterns for a given, um, for a given mass distribution. So that's, this isn't a big contribution to uncertainty actually. It's, um, and then the other thing we do is we randomly draw GIA kind of estimates. You can see that we kind of do this process for you know many thousand times, and that gives a kind of a distribution for a specific um, latitude longitude pair, which is really what we are generating projections for. Okay, so the rest of the talk is uh, just going to focus on these sixteen example tie gauge locations. So these are selected specifically to span a range of projection re regimes. So we're really trying to understand how different these projections can look across the world. Uh, and then tide gauge data at these locations is used to estimate the local um, annual sea level variability um, to understand how that may play into future changes as well. So if we look at the 21st century sea level projections, in each case, I've got the RCP 2.6 scenario in blue, RCP 8.5 in red, and then the tide gauge data in black. Um, so what we can see is although many of the locations have similar looking projections of similar magnitude, there are some places that really stand out being significantly different. So Barentsburg, which is in um, Svalbard. Um, there's Reykjavik in Iceland. Uh, and Oslo is the other one. Let's see if I can. There it is. Okay, so got this negative. Um, so this is mostly to do with GIA here, it'll be to do with GIA here, but you can see that there are some, some large um, geographic dependencies. We see um, a particularly widespread of projections for New York, which is related to the uncertainty in the ocean circulation response over the 21st century, for example. And I guess in all cases, the um, you can start to get a sense of over the 21st century of how the projected changes compare to the local annual variability. Uh, and that as well varies somewhat um, by geographic location. So one of the um, nice things I think you can do is start to look at this framework that was put forward some time ago now by Hawkins and Sutton, where you 
look at the um, uncertainties of kind of or the fraction of variance that arises from the local variability, um, um, the emission scenario, and the model the model spread. And at all locations, really, the variability tends to be a big part of the story for the you know for the first few decades. Um, <clears throat> and as is quite well known, I guess, but it's nice to see this kind of illustrated that the scenario only really becomes important after the second half of the 21st century. Um, so it's interesting to consider how much of this variability might be predictable for these different kind of locations and um, to appreciate that the low dependence on scenario, at least for the coming decades, means that, you know, there's relative certainty in the sort of um, in the sort of sea level rates of sea level rise we might see and that our our choices on emissions are only really going to start to kick in later this century and in subsequent centuries. So it's a similar plot to the one I showed before, but now we've extended this, the projections to 2300 and what becomes immediately apparent is now that the um, the um, change signals, as you might expect, are very, very much larger than the than the sea level variability as seen in the tide gauge records. Um, we can see that there's a more of a separation um, among the two scenarios on these kind of time scales, except for some special places where there's some interesting things going on. So at Reykjavik and Barentsburg. So essentially what happens there is to do with the, to do with the, um, because the proximity to uh, Greenland, you're actually getting a negative contribution from Greenland. And so that's kind of tending to cancel out the contribution from Antarctica. <clears throat> So I'm going to have a quick look at the chat. Um, okay, uh, I'll probably, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll come back to that question if that's okay towards the end and we can pick that up in discussion. Okay. Um, okay, so then we can go a bit further and we can compute the covariance matrix of these projections. And that's what I'm showing you here. Um, <clears throat> so what we have is the total variance for the two, two different scenarios here, but really, I guess the emphasis of where I'd like you to draw your attention are these filled contours to the in the middle and right hand plots. <clears throat> so we can break down how much the uncertainty is coming from these different factors on the left hand side. So this is the color key. And you can see that that um, so the the um, top row is for the globe. And then I go through some of these locations that we've discussed. And it's interesting to see that the breakdown of variance is quite dependent on the geographic location. Um, <clears throat> and it's to do with the spatial, it's a lot to do with, um, you know, the various uncertainties. So how well is uh, GIA known? And that's particularly uncertain for kind of Reykjavik. For Barentsburg, there's a particularly strong uh, kind of contribution to variance from, from the glacier uh, part. And then in New York, you know, we have a very large component from the stereodynamic and uh, relatively large from GIA. Um, <clears throat> although one of the general themes you'll see is that in, in um, subsequent plots, it tends to be the Antarctic ice dynamic turn that starts to dominate um, as we go to longer time scales. I guess the other interesting thing is how this breakdown of variance depends on the emission scenario. So whether we follow RCP 2.6 or RCP 8.5, is also um, so the breakdown of variance is also somewhat dependent on that scenario. Um, so there's a few more uh, locations here. So Mera in Japan, Diamond Harbor is um, in um, uh, in India. Um, Palermo is in uh, South America, and Stanley Two's in the in the in the Falkland Islands. So quite we're getting quite close to Antarctica there. Um, so anyway, I guess you can see these these interesting dependencies on the time scale and the scenario. But overall, there is a tendency for Antarctic ice dynamics to be the dominant uncertainty overall, which I think um, uh, you know is kind of largely borne out by um, the science as a whole. Though I would I would say certainly for these um, when when we look at longer time scale. So this is the variance to 2100. But as we go to 2300, obviously, we get these slightly different uh, pictures emerging. Uh, but it's very clear, this dependence of the or, or the importance of the Antarctic ice dynamic processes for this uncertainty. 
Okay. Um, so just to summarize, and then we can get into some discussion. Um, so projections of sea level change out to 2300 have been developed that are traceable to the CMIP5 models. Um, and actually this, and that generic two layer model framework has been utilized in AR6 as well to develop projections which are consistent with the assessment of climate sensitivity. Um, the 2300 projections illustrate that there's committed sea level rise under all scenarios uh, for the vast majority of locations around the world. And of course that sets some minimum kind of requirements in terms of coastal adaptation to maintain current levels of exposure to coastal flooding and, and such like. Um, the future sea level change is strongly dependent on, on the geographic location. And, and in general, you know, the signals are large to local variability. And obviously that implies that some adaptation will be necessary, assuming that we're able to deal with the year to year variability that we see currently. Um, and the dominant drivers of the variance in projections do vary as a function of location, time, horizon and scenario, uh, particularly post 2100, when you see the difference in the scenarios start to emerge. Um, and I'll stop there and um, have some questions. Thanks for your attention. Uh, thanks so much, Matt. That, that was fascinating talk. Um, do you mind? Uh, uh, Gavin is clapping. Oh, <laughs> virtually. Um, yeah, so, uh, if you've got any questions, guys, please feel free to you know raise your hand virtually or or, or say so in the chat. To start us off, there's I think a comment um, from Vivian. Yes, uh, I, I was just curious about um, uh, how you handle the land water storage as, as one of the components of sea level, you know, in, in your total. Yeah, so I'm, it's, land water storage is, is not really my area of expertise, but we, we, it's, it's, it's based on the assumptions that were made in, in AR5. And um, on those longer time horizons, we just, we just, um, we just keep the, um, we, we hold the rates constant. One thing to say about the land water storage term is that it's not a scenario dependent term. I think, I think in AR6, they have developed some scenario dependence for land water storage. And actually one of the things I'm working on now is kind of understanding what's different in AR6 and how it changes things for these UK CP18 projections, which are currently the basis for, you know, for the UK government. And we, we kind of are looking into where the differences are. Um, but yeah, I hope that, answer helps a bit. Thank you. Uh, do we do we have any other questions? So I, I thought that the, uh, the the plots you showed um, of the tendencies for the different components was was, was really awesome. I'm sure. Uh, could you speak perhaps more about how those are calculated? I'm sure there's relatively simple. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's essentially what what we what we do is we we just compute the covariance matrix across the whole 450,000 member ensemble. Um, one of the things I didn't really speak much about is there are some kind of interaction terms. So that's like the off diagonals, you know, of the, of, of the covariance matrix. Um, and, and, and those kind of interaction terms are quite important for some areas. It was kind of a yellowed out band, but I think, I think the thing that's interesting about them is that- Is there um, any chance you can put them up? Yeah, sure. Let me, um, in fact, I kind of, uh, let me see. So let's, uh, I think I think the ones out to 2300 are kind of good because it's got all the time scales there in one place. And um, yeah, so you can see, so this, this bit is the interactions terms, which um, for some, under some circumstances is, is significant. But I think the thing that I, that ex I mean, I kind of wanted to do this kind of analysis for quite a few years, I thought it'd be neat to understand what's driving the uncertainty, particularly as a function of time scale and the geographic location. But I think the things that's interesting is it's kind of telling you that if you, you know, depending on your geographic location, your research priorities for reducing uncertainty, the projections are going to be different. Um, and I think that's potentially 
quite useful information. I think the other thing that I kind of felt was that particularly in AR5, while there were some useful statements made about, you know, uh, the majority of um, geographic locations will see global, you know, uh, a sea level rise within plus or minus 20% of the global mean, I think for some locations that would is potentially misleading. And so I think there really is a need to, um, you know, do this site specific analysis and, and, and kind of it's, it's a bit dangerous to assume that we can just, um, you know, take a, a projection within a, within a certain tolerance of the global mean. Um, obviously, we haven't discussed any of the non-climatic drivers such as plate tectonics and other things. So I think it's a, a, a rich and wonderful subject to study when you really get into, um, you know, uh, kind of decision making and kind of adaptation planning. Um, when we did some work in um, in Singapore a, few, a couple of years prior to this, um, it was very clear that one of the major threats to Singapore is actually um, one of the fault lines off Sumatra, I think, which would have consequences um, and could see you know several tens of centimeters of sea level rise for Singapore um, over a few decades were there to be a major um, um, kind of earthquake within that area. So there's lots of, you know, there's lots of, it's a great kind of integrator of geophysical processes and it makes it very interesting. Um, okay, I'm, I've seen another question from Gavin actually. Is it possible that the interaction terms is underestimated? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that, I think all of, um, it, it, I, I guess do, doing a bit more work on understanding what the limitations are of the framework I've presented here. I mean, I've kind of, I think there is more work to, like it'd be interesting to know how this would, how this analysis would play out with the methods done in AR6, for example, where there's more kind of explicit modeling that has kind of gone into that, particularly the ice sheet terms. Um, but the information we have so far is that the overall picture hasn't really changed that much. Um, there's also been some interesting papers published to do with, you know, um, so one interesting thing to think about is things like, you know, the polar kind of amplification and, and climate sensitivity within a single model. And um, this kind of approach that we've had in the past where we do these offline um, calculations for the ice sheets, how might that look if we did have a ice sheet model kind of embedded within a particular GCM. And I think those sorts of correlations are interesting to think about. So, you know, to think about the, th the physical processes and, um, you know, I would expect high climate sensitivity models, particularly for the Greenland ice sheet to have, a, you know, a very strong correlation with that. And there may be some second, you know, some, it may not be that linear. Um, I think we also know that for the Antarctic ice sheet, um, you know, it's the spatial pattern of changes are probably more important than the global mean temperature. So I think there is, you know, reason to suspect that some of this structure may not be, um, you know, 100% correct. And there's room for, you know, further work to explore those areas. Um, I mean, one thing I should add as well, I suppose, is that, you know, this doesn't, none of this work explicitly considered these these high end scenarios or these um, so that there is no within these within this set of projections there is no uh, explicit representation of self sustaining feedbacks in Antarctica for example um, and actually when it comes to you know how do we um, how do we articulate um, the kind of lower probability outcomes which are hard to quantify so you know when I referred to the AR six saying, you know, we can't rule out 15 metres of global sea level rise by 2300. I think there is a need to develop physically consistent narrative scenarios, which, which span some of that uncertainty so that we can have some understanding of what that might look regionally around the world, you know. Um, so that's another area of uh, science I'm particularly interested. I know it's, um, yeah, um, it, it, it seems like one of the, uh, priorities moving forward is to better span some of that uncertainty space associated with these lower likelihood outcomes but it they they represent an important part of the 
of the of of the risk landscape um right because, you know, I, I i was i you know obviously i mean if, if west antarctica collapses then you know worrying about land water storage or even vertical land motion or any of this stuff is really kind of irrelevant so um I, but I, I was thinking i was thinking more of uh interactions such as um the the changes in, in the freshwater balance um changing like regional uh, temperatures in, in antarctica or accelerating um uh the uh the the collapse of the north atlantic um overturning right i mean th these are real kind of uh you know like kind of physical oceanography type things or you know we're just doing a better job of you know connecting the wind patterns around south uh, around antarctica to the under ice shelf melt conditions i mean like these are not things that are uh included in uh in any of the cmip6 models to date um and while you know people have looked at them in in more specialized models right if you're going to use cmip6 as your base right then then we know that there are uh you know uh, potentially important interactions that that aren't included right so how do we how do we build that in i mean yeah great question i think some of this stuff is in the pipeline in terms of developing fully coupled ice sheets in so for example within the UA, uk esm model they are you know they do have an interactive greenland ice sheet and they're coupling in an antarctic ice sheet they're trying to represent the ice sheet cavities so i think i think we're on the the cusp of doing some modeling studies and th th there'd be a long way to go probably before they are the preferable route for the for the sea level projections, I think there's still some long-standing model biases and some, you know, really fundamental uh, work to do on the representation of those processes and those models. But that's where the, um, you know, that's where the science is going. So I think things will progress. I, I think in terms of a, a state, you know, providing information to stakeholders, you know, where we are now, then I think it is my view is that I guess as I've showed but didn't say explicitly I think the kind of central estimate projections have are now relatively stable since AR5 they didn't change much for SROC they haven't changed that much for AR6 so I think there is I think these narrative type scenarios which should consider in in uh, my view um, exactly the sorts of things that you've been talking about it, they should be tied into physical physical possibilities that we can describe um you know like an amok collapse or a, you know i mean the antarctic issue i guess is fairly well known now um but yeah so i think it's how 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 do we communicate and provide uh, actionable information on the basis of those possibilities and uh, i think that's in the short term where it'll go i think in the longer term we can explicit start to explicitly uh, or at least, well, it'll be a mixture of explicit representation and parameterizations of key processes in Earth system models as we move forward. And um, but that will be, you know, uh, that's a, uh, I guess that's a, a longer term ambition that will be realised in the coming years and decades. I guess I don't know. I mean, it seems like certainly the next five to ten years will be very active um, area of research. Um, so Jeff Ridley, I can see he's got a question on saying Tamsin's Edwards paper suggests that there is no scenario dependence of Antarctic contribution to sea level rise. Um, I think that that's still an open question of what that scenario's um, sensitivity should be. I think it relates to the question or the comment I made about how important the spatial pattern is. Maybe that's it's likely to be more important than the than the total global warming. Uh, can you use such for process models? I'm not sure I understand that. I don't know if you want to ask your question verbally, Jeff. And... Okay. If, if, if are, Jeff's you, not... oh. are you there, Jeff? You might be having difficulty unmuting or feel like. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to think what I mean. Can you use such? I mean, I think there's loads of interesting stuff to do an with Antarctica and, and actually the water, you know, the water mass structure in that region and, and the relatively warm circumpolar 
deep water and you know mechanisms to pump that up onto the shelf uh, and, and that could happen by kind of internal variability or presume or, or maybe force responses I mean I, I think it's a fascinating area to think about and it seems like it could be one of those elements of the climate system with relative where relatively small scale processes could really have major impacts for the kind of large scale response of the system um, so I think it's fascinating um, then Christopher Schumann saying that ice cliff instability so that's really the the mechanism you really need to realize these very large rates of um, sea level rise from Antarctica um, is still an area of considerable debate um, which I agree with I guess AR6 took the view that they can't rule out you know um, the DeConto and Pollard type simulations which form the basis of those very large um, sea rates that you know, Kind of magnitudes of sea level rise you know by 2300 um i think uh i guess from an ipcc's perspective we you know we need more simulations and a, you know more lines of evidence to try and constrain that, that 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 area um i guess i'm interested in the in in what we would observe under those narrative scenarios as well what would the sequence of observable events look like and that's uh I think an interesting area to think about um and i guess yeah the 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 kind of re the real world trajectory in the context of the projections is something i'm i'm very interested in as well and you know i think it does all of this speaks to you know the need to monitor um these various different aspects Uh, do we have uh, any other any other uh, final questions? We're just ever so we're just ever so slightly over uh, noon here in, in, in New York. Silence. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I, I just want to say a huge thank you again, uh, Matt, for, for speaking. And um, I think you suggested earlier on that you might be willing to do another one. Yeah, it would be good to talk about some of the AR6 work, particularly in, on the observations, um, but um, maybe can schedule something for for the new year or another time later this year. But um, yeah, I just want to say thanks to everyone for coming along and for the questions and your interest in the work. And it's great to, to see those of you. <laughs> who I've seen and uh, yeah thanks for listening okay uh, thanks everyone uh, hope you have a great rest of the day cheers thanks thanks Craig bye thanks everyone. all thank you Greg. Bye.